First, I want to thank Frank, Elizabeth, Lisa, and Mark for their perspicacious comments today. I'm just going to bring out just a couple of threads in a minute or two. I say we preserve the past by wrapping it up entirely in the present. While Frank thinks, he said something like, oh, the, the, the model for sustainability might be okay in historic houses. I've never found one that can sustain itself at all. And the only way that we're going to be able to move forward in this 21st century is to make sure that we're terribly community focused, I think, as, as all of these speakers have said. That means our community is engaged in discussions about social justice, as they said, labor practices, inclusivity, exclusivity, racial challenges. They're responsible for helping us collect artifacts to document stories and oral histories. Uh, oral histories, until fairly recently, were not something that we often use in historic houses or museums. We have to blow up our notions of collecting uh, and, and use of artifacts. Again, community collects and brings them into an institution. It may span from the time the building is built until the day the person walked out of that building. It comes right up to the present. It also means that people can use those artifacts. That's a, you know, we, we think about our, our um, responsibilities as stewards, but we also have a responsibility to share and interpret and to ensure that these stories are passed down from generation to generation. It also means that we talk about who's represented in these places that we haven't traditionally represented. I'm looking forward to Fairlane's discussion. One of my issues with historic houses is that the most important discussions of our lives happen in houses. Right? Those are universal issues that we discuss in historic houses. They're about family. They're about love. They're about challenges. They're about disasters. They're about disappointments. They're about relationships between fathers and sons. Ah, talk about a complex relationship between Henry Ford and his only child, Edsel Ford. Those discussions in the house could be incredibly interesting, uh, really moving, and have real resonance for us today, for those of us who have children who've had successes and challenges as well. These are new ways of thinking about historic houses as program spaces, as well as places that are aesthetically pleasing. Uh, narratives that have that provide meaningful interactions between staff and visitors but between visitors and visitors our historic houses can be revelatory they can be transforming but they should always be provocative I think our four speakers today really hit that hit that ball right out of the, the park in terms of that uh, in order for t our historic houses to last into the 21st century we know what people think as they walk into them we've got to change I think they gave us some tools for thinking about that. I'd like to bring all four of them up here so that if they uh, have any questions that they can field for you all, this is your time to talk to them. Do we have a, should I use this one? Is this the, is this the? Uh, yeah, I think our speakers are all powerful enough. Okay. We probably don't need them, but yep. we uh, <laughs> do have a few mics if you want to. Oh, okay. We've got a few minutes. This is your chance to, to ask questions. All right. <laughs> yeah. Questions? Or you can ask each other questions. Yeah. <laughs> I was just what the name of the man or the type of floor refinishing he does, that's passive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are you going over to Fairlane today on the tour? No, unfortunately. Okay, then, before, then when we're done, uh, I will gladly share that with you, tell you a little bit about Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Greg. Um, are you planning on interpreting the service quarters or um, that service hall in the Fairlane estate? So the question is about uh, restoring and interpreting and experiential um, the domestic side of uh, fair. Absolutely. Uh, we started with the formal rooms as the first one because they're the most impact, you know, from visual. Uh, also the best documented, go figure. And so it's a little easier from that, but also part of it, as you guys know, that it's about selling things uh, to stakeholders and to uh, funders. And so those, we want to get those up so we can continue to raise money. But Without a doubt, we, um, you know, Nancy talked about oral histories. We're very blessed with a lot of oral histories as well, too. So these are not just names on a paper. These are people that we know a lot about. There was a question back there, Greg. Sure. Uh, I guess a question for Lisa. Um, I'm wondering, sorry. I, I imagine you have a collegial relationship with uh, Jennifer Scott and the um, Hull House, but do you have any type of formal relationship given your share history or are you contemplating any shared programs or anything between the two institutions? Um, not 
currently, I mean, I used to be the director of the Hull House Museum for seven years, and then, you know, we brought on Jennifer. The um, Hull House Museum is part of the University of Illinois. Um, I am very excited about a partnership with the College of Urban <coughs> Planning um, and thinking about the relationship of how, what a public housing museum can do in the arts and culture arena that public policy makers around housing can't do in bridging that divide. And so I think that what I'm trying to do is forge a formal relationship with UIC, but not necessarily with the College of Architecture, Arts, and Design, which is what runs the Hull House Museum, but with an urban <laughs> planning and a policy um, institute. And so we've done some of that work before. Um, and then the other part of it is uh, UIC is about to take on uh, the John Marshall Law School. And so I'm really interested in thinking about how um, house museums and other sorts of museums can be at the table for conversations around cultural repatriation of objects. And you know, a lot of people have talked about, Amal Clooney has talked about how when she's you know, trying to get these objects returned, there's no arts and cultural people at the table. They're all lawyers, right? And like, we actually understand the power of culture, the importance of objects, and we should be at those tables, but we actually have to go to school and really learn a lot about sort of legal policies and other kinds of things too. And so so I think there, we're, we started a conversation about Hall House Gallery 400, which is a contemporary art space, and hopefully the, the National Public Housing Museum being part of a unit where students can sort of do that work as a form of praxis. Yeah. But right now the public housing residents also want to be independent. They're suspicious of institutions for a long time, the museum, they were like, oh, it's the CHA Museum, or you know, not. And so um, I think for a little bit, letting it breathe and be independent is the right um, thing to do. How about a right over here? Um, just as an aside, talking about public housing, I just got an email the other day um, that Detroit is looking for a firm to um, do a historic resources study of their public housing mm. works, and I don't oh, know what the plan yeah. is, but it's kind of interesting. Yeah, that's Emma. Emma, don't worry about the mic. Okay. I think people can be heard. How about over there? Um, I have a question about the reproduction of, of artworks and of furniture and sort of coming from Rinalda House where it's really an art collection in a, a house museum versus something like the Edsel and Eleanor Ford House where you have to go to the DIA if you want to see the real postman, but the postman's <laughs> still there in the house. Um, and what do you think the balance of how a house museum is a cultural museum versus the house museum as an art museum and as a space that benefits the art through the decoration as well. So my, my just two cents with that one um, is I think it depends on the, the museum. Some of them really embrace, you know, is the collections that are releasing for existence or for, and then you know, um, as a level Ford House, although some of the artworks are have been reproduced because they're donated with the generosity and the legacy. Of the Ford family to the DIA, there are still many significant pieces there and beautiful decorative arts and furnishings, and so that's celebrated there as well, too. Uh, what I love, though, because again, I'm a curatorial, curatorial guy, I love that stuff, but I also love now with Fairlane, we have best, kind of the best of both worlds. And so I think it depends on the strength of the collection. You know, my philosophy is there's enough great historic houses out there celebrating the decorative arts. We don't need another one. I also, can I just quickly say that I actually think the huge opportunity for the 21st century is uh, around historic houses claiming the debates around authenticity, um, you know, through the decorative arts, but also conversations about identity, right? What does it mean to be a real Asian, a real African American, etc.? And this, there's a lot of great work, and the art, his, like, art history sometimes is behind the curve, I think, to a lot of other fields. But in this respect, our history is so far forward. There's a great essay, which I'm forgetting now, um, who wrote it, but I'll send it to you if you have an issue, which is about when an object is returned to its original space, but then they couldn't return it, so they had to make like a, the re reproduction of it. But that actually, the, it's the space that made people cry, not the artwork. But the power of place was so overwhelming, right? So there's sort of like this question of like what makes something authentic and what doesn't. And I think that's something that in this world of mirage and you know it, that's going to be a key question. And what an opportunity for historic house museums to sort of take that on and really address it. One thing that I know is that people are very moved by the aura of the authentic. Um, in between Monticello and Montpelier, I worked for two and a half years at Renolda, 
which is the estate, the temporary to Fairlane of Catherine and R.J. Reynolds of Tobacco uh -oh. Infamy. And it is in Salem, South Carolina, where Frank now lives and works. And fascinatingly, so it was created in 1917. The granddaughter turned it into an art museum in 1967. So when it first opened as an art museum, it was the family house the way it was. It, they had like plaid furniture and dog hair. And <laughs> people could go there and sit on the furniture and look at the amazing art that the granddaughter had collected. I mean, it's, it's a very important collection. So maybe about 10 years ago, they did, they did kind of a redo. And they actually returned the house to the way it had looked when the first generation had moved in. And they made it into a house museum. So it really, I mean, you know, here we are in Vegas. It really, I would say, lost something. Yeah. Like, I would also say for the first time, we brought the real Nobel Peace Prize for the opening of the you know, new four exhibition at the Hull House Museum. Swarthmore had never lent it. It was in a piece collection. I went and I picked it up. My daughter pretended to bite into it. It was a chocolate. It was great. But anyway, we put it you know, in the vitrine. It was the original. And then, but it was a long-term five-year uh, loan, and then they wanted it back. So then there was reproduction that was sort of placed in. No, I mean, I agree that there is an aura to authenticity, but actually the important story in the work that we did at the museum was contrasting her Nobel Peace Prize with her FBI file and sort of thinking about how is somebody could be so celebrated as, you know, the most important woman in America, but also be the most dangerous woman in America. And that's the story. That was the story that had legs that brought people back, that inspired people, not the fact that it was the real Nobel Peace Prize. I'm not saying I agree with this, yeah. but the question that we get all day long, every single day, is is this is this yeah. authentic? And our so. <laughs> the educators at the Hall House were really for, trained in dialogic, you know, sort of exercises. And the question is, why does it matter to you, right? Because it's the that's the real question. And to really hear why people care so much about the originality and what's at stake in our society, which I think it's not. You don't we don't have to dictate the answer, but to ask the question is important. I think you have a problem with people want to see Elvis. They don't want to see an Elvis impersonator. They want to see Elvis. Yes. All of you have spoken so, uh, so much about um, community and community engagement, and how you bring together community voices in your interpretation. Primarily, I'm uh, wondering what Fairlane's plans are for engaging community in some of these big ideas uh, that you would want to explore after the restoration is done? Yeah, uh, very great question. Again, this is one that we are have been talking about. Um, there's a couple issues there. For those who aren't familiar with the area, we're about uh, 22 miles apart, but any given day drive time between the two states is a half hour to 45 minutes an hour. Um, and you have two very different <laughs> communities. You have Gross Point Shores and you have Dearborn. And they're very different for a whole host of reasons. And in Rightfully so, we, those who have now kind of moved over from Gross Point, are outsiders. And so we know, number one, that we need to engage that community, not just because uh, strategically all that, because it is the right thing to do. We are part of that community and a bit larger holistic community. So we're looking at that. We've been engaging people slowly about that. One of our problems is that we are not open to the public right now. And that was a decision that was made uh, by our board. And so we can't just go out and bring everybody in constantly as much as some of us would love to see that experience and getting people engaged ground floor up. So we are doing it kind of very systematically, very focused, but we know uh, we stand no chance of hell to be successful if we are not intimately, and I just don't mean superficial, intimately part of that community. But you also, I mean, you haven't mentioned the Henry Ford enthusiast groups. Oh, I know them well. <laughs> And, yep. and we used to volunteer there and put on programs. And yep. I think, felt like they kind of owned the place, would go around and make little changes. And they really view Henry as St. Henry. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Going back to what Kristen had to say about it, you know, the guy was not exactly a saint for a whole bunch of reasons. And I think, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that challenge and how you're dealing with that. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I'm real. And I want to be respectful of time as well. And I know that is a deep, deep, it is like, you could give me hook, line, and sinker on that one. Um, but the fact of the matter is, yes, uh, very complex, very controversial. 
Um, and uh, we know that, and I think, again, for me, this is just me speaking, I can't speak for anybody else, I think the best way is to embrace it head on, be honest, be transparent, mm -hmm. and just, I, I don't know if it was you, Frank, or one of you guys would say, you know, you just, sometimes you just got to be that, you know, push it, and it's going to be uncomfortable for some. Um, but as it comes and it, you know, develops and warms up, you know, it will become normal conversation. And what the hell are we doing if we're not talking about people authentically and who they were, not just for the, you know, for the gossip, but what does that mean for us today? How do we change lives? How do we change opinions? How do we inspire people today? Frank, I'd like to just talk about one project, and that is the Latimer House in Flushing, Queens. Latimer is one of the most important African-American inventors and one of the most important inventors, period. Not many people know about him or knew about him as one of the houses that I ran in New York City. We had 41 visitors the previous year prior to me coming. So what I did is I shut it down and we started doing intensive engagement. It was really the beginning of the Anarchist Guide research. And so I think even one of the videos I showed up there with all those videos was us going around flushing, um, talking to people. Of course, Flushing is around 85% Mandarin speaking, first and second generation Chinese, right? So here we've got this incredibly important African American narrative in a place which is not only Mandarin speaking, but one of the most diverse places anywhere on the earth, right? And so here's this house that's getting 41 visitors. There's obviously a problem. What we did is through lots of community engagement before we did anything, before I changed a single thing, um, and we emptied out the house, turned it into this massive tinkering studio, which played on both um, Latimer's invention narrative, um, along with invention narrative of the Chinese and Chinese Americans. And I hired two executive directors to run that. I will say I've been gone three years now, um, and the tinkering studio is still going strong. And in fact, it just won an award for interpretation. But I didn't do that without a intensive kind of community research. I didn't move on that. Um, and then I want to just, as I like to do, throw in a question. Um, I wonder what Henry Ford's view on public housing was. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't ask that uh, in a negative way. I'm just saying, to me, that's the only reason why I would go here. Because you're saying you don't want to make it a decorative arts museum. And I don't care if everything is a duplicate, because we're talking about authenticity. You know I'm setting an ideal type here to have a conversation. Um, but to me, I don't care if it's all reconstructed and I can sit on it. That's like baseline OK. That's like baseline engagement. That's like the physicality of engagement. It's like, really, really, what is it that's going to get me out there? And I really want to know the money spent on that building, how is that going to forward issues from the front page of today? And you start to engage that because you're like, OK, entrepreneurial, it's hipsters, I get all that. It's all, all right. You know, it's all right there. But one wonders if, again, I'm just saying this without really thinking about it, that that sunroom wouldn't make a better social justice dialogue room than a reproduction of the Ford's sunroom. I'm not saying that's true, you know? Um, but I also think that isn't this area one of the largest immigration areas for Asian and Syrian Arab 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 Yeah, uh, I mean, you know. Lebanese. Lebanese, like this is a, and I do believe that Ford was strongly anti-immigration. Oh, oh yeah. no. 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 one of the reasons it's actually quite like that is because he opened people in. That's why Deerbrook is Deerbrook. So, so this, this is a really fascinating, yeah. meaty part <laughs> of the conversation to me. So I just throw that out there. Not that I disagree with what well, you're doing, it's just. No, that's interesting what Frank said there, because actually uh, that's exactly part of the, what we imagine. What we chose to do is, you know, you're, you're, the, the Sun Porch is a good example. A great place to have dialogue about social justice. I absolutely agree. Actually, it's a great space to talk about environmentalism and conser uh, conservation because of a whole bunch of reasons. But being in an authentic space or recreate an authentic space adds to the experience further. So we're looking at those spaces to do exactly that, but instead of having an empty room that you can be in a damn conference room at a hotel, 
being in a place of history, of power, I think lends potentially something to these conversations. But, and also, I would ask, um, you know, I'm sort of sick of civic dialogue, so I did it for like 15 years of my life, and so there is a part where I wonder, in this era of sort of growing disparity between wealth um, and people who have nothing, like what would it mean to actually turn that space into a place for workers' rights, right? And uh, this has actually happened in sort of war museums that have decided, you know what, this is a space, I'm trying to remember, like General it's like the Beirut Mac House Museum right. I showed. Exactly, or General MacArthur's house, I remember they, they decided to say, you know what, why wouldn't we become a peace museum? Who wouldn't know more about the importance of creating peace than somebody who's always engaged in war, right? There's, like, I mean, I feel like there's, um, and, and yes, there's a question about being relevant and bringing in visitors, which I think is critical, but also how about because it's the right thing to do, and the arc of justice is where like, it's going, and we want to be on the right side of history. Like, I mean, I think that's a compelling reason. But I will also say this. I am, in my heart, a fundraiser. No! <laughs> right? So I get it. You know, when you're saying we need to finish a room and we need to I, get the money. I, believe, I know, yeah. I get that. Yeah, yeah, I get it. But I also think that, like, Andrew Smith's thing, which is, like, yeah, Yes, the 1% has most of the money and all the guns, but the good thing is we have all the people, right? It's like 99% of the people. And the reality is when you have a house museum, one of the biggest problems is you never hear people say, oh yeah, I once went to the Art Institute when I was like six. That was awesome. But with house museums, we have this problem, right? Which is built Fourth in. Grade. Right, it's like you've gone once and you don't need to go again. And you still the same. Yeah, it's exactly. Never right, and so we need to really <laughs> invigorate these spaces with the programming, with the kind of activities why people would want to go because of the front page, not because, you know, of some particular history. We need to wrap this up because yeah. you folks need to have lunch and get to Fairlane. We want to thank you for your attention. We want to thank again. Yeah.